We spend an awful lot of time talking about quarterbacks. We spend an awful lot of time having no understanding whatsoever how difficult a position that is. And we spend an awful lot of time, even if you work with expertise in football, measuring <laughs> successfully the value of quarterbacks. It's fairly amazing how much we talk about this, but we don't have any idea sometimes that Tom Brady can play and everyone in the league doesn't think so, or executive of the year Bill Polian thinks that Lamar Jackson is not a quarterback and he wins the MVP. You give Daniel Jones a bunch of money, and now all of us are like, well, I don't know if he's worth that amount of money. And Brock Purdy might be the best quarterback okay, in the NFL. So we bring in RG3. He's here. He's got a new partnership with Wave Sports and Entertainment, and we will talk about his new podcast where I'm assuming he will talk some football and other things. But explain mm -hmm. to me why it is we're so bad at this. Is it because it's such a hard position to project and so many things go into telling you whether or not someone is good. Anyone would have looked at you playing and said, he's great at quarterback. You got into the perfect system and it, you know, it broke your physical body because, right. because the sport is really hard. And right. I would like for you to just walk me through this labyrinth. Do you know who's good? <laughs> do you know who's good? You're watching and you can do yep. all the assessments and tell me, well, 10 sacks isn't Daniel Jones's fault. Uh, I would say that there's just not a lot of coaches out there in the NFL that know how to develop quarterbacks. You know, when you see a guy play and you know he can play, it, it gets into this whole weird world of, oh, well, can he process information? And are his is his footwork great? And like Aaron Rodgers has a very unique footwork. I think we would all agree about that. But it works for him and his body. It doesn't work for every single quarterback. So far too often coaches try to coach guys according to a certain blueprint, but that's not always how it goes. Look at CJ Stroud. CJ said, I'm not a test taker, right? I'm a football player. He scored bad on that one test, according to the rumors. And now he's playing the best of all the rookie quarterbacks with the Houston Texans, with a group of weapons that most people thought he wouldn't be able to play good with. So when I see it, I know it. I know that Caleb Williams is a great player. I know that Michael Penix Jr. is a great player, and I know that Shadir Sanders is a great quarterback. It's about where they go and the support system that they have in the NFL. That's going to determine whether or not they make it. Uh, and, and that's really what it boils down to. It's not about just footwork. It's not about just processing speed. It's not just about leadership. It's about the leadership of the organization that they go to. And right now you see an influx of quarterbacks coming in and out of the league and being rotated through because these organizations don't know how to develop them. Who's the best at developing quarterbacks right now? I mean, I think for a long time it's been Andy Reid, and it's not just because of Patrick Mahomes. It's just look at his track record with the quarterback spot. You know, going back to Donovan McNabb, you look at him being able to rehabilitate Michael Vick when he came out of prison, um, the, he, what he got out of Alex Smith there in Kansas City for a few years, and then what he's done with Patrick Mahomes. He's by far the best but he doesn't try to change his guys. Donovan was unique, you know, not the most elusive, or I want to say that, not the fastest runner, but a big guy, strong, and was elusive. Michael Vick, told completely different. Very fast and elusive. Look at Alex Smith. Could run, right? Straight line speed, but not the most elusive guy in the world. And Patrick Mahomes is just like a conglomerate of all those guys put together with less speed. So it, a coach's ability to take what his guy does best and apply that to the rest of what they're doing in their game plan, I think is a special thing. And, and right now people are, don't want to admit it, but there's just, you know, coaching is behind in the NFL as opposed to where it is in college football right now. I have not heard a lot of that, but I want to go down a path with you about how you would have fared, or if you've considered how you would have fared mm -hmm. if Andy Reid had gotten a hold of you at the beginning, oh. how that would have played out differently. But before I do that, is that in the background a pterodactyl, a child, a swinging, uh, a, <laughs> a, a, a rusty there? swing yeah. set? Like, mm -hmm. what, is, what is happening? What is Coach. shrieking in the background there? I, oh. I thought that was on our end. I wasn't sure if you guys could hear that, <laughs> okay? But... Yeah. Just like my podcast setup, uh, that's our eight-month-old daughter, Gia, the one that I ran off the football field for. So at times, she's just going to scream out. I think she was screaming because she was agreeing with what I was saying, yes. you know, but that's just me being I, a dad I, trying I, to make will, it make I, sense. I will ask you about that. She likes Andy Reid. Huh? That, that day eight months ago, you ran right off of television uh, when when you learned you were having – 
a baby. Uh, yep. th- and But before we do that, though, answer my question about what you yep. think would have happened differently if Andy Reid had been the coach. Well, it's, it's funny you ask that because at the Combine, uh, Andy Reid, uh, when he was still with the Philadelphia Eagles, actually had a meeting with me. And at this point in time, I, I kind of knew where I was probably going to end up uh, in the draft order-wise. And Philly was, was, was outside of that. Uh, well outside of that but he had the meeting with me and he told me hey you never know what can happen in this league you never know what can happen in the draft so I wanted to sit you down talk with you and and you know just pick your mind when it comes to football Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that meeting now I'll say this I don't ever look back and say man I wonder what would have happened if this I went there I went there I went to Washington that was where I was supposed to be everything that happened when I was in Washington was part of my journey it's part of my story and I'm a better man father and player because of it Um, but if you ask me, had I gone with Andy Reed, would he have tried to, uh, kind of change who I was as a player and, or as a person in his system? No, I don't think that would have happened. I look at Lamar Jackson and him being able to go to an organization like the Baltimore Ravens that fully accepted who he was fully allowed him to be himself. You know, Lamar talks a little bit different. He wears his hair a little bit different and they embrace that. Uh, good organizations, great organizations know how to embrace what makes a player who he is and then build upon that. And I didn't have that when I went to Washington. But like I said, it's part of my journey. Uh, And with Andy Reid, I think it would have been more similar to what Lamar has been going through and the support he's had with the Baltimore Ravens because it comes from the top down. And when Andy Reid was in Philly, they had us, they had stability there. And I think that's important for a young quarterback to have the stability with not just the head coach, but with how they do business from the top down. Uh, with respect to what you said about not liking to look back, uh, <laughs> most people would look at the surface. You had a wonderful rookie season and right. the coaches that you had in Washington, they revisit every time they're on primetime football. Look at this staff. It's an all-star staff of coaches. And while Andy Reid certainly has this great reputation, Kyle Shanahan is now looked at as one of those guys, and he was with mm-hmm. you in Washington. And when you talk yep. about cohesiveness throughout the organization, what was yep. the single biggest impediment to you in Washington from that amazing rookie year and all that promise to where things turned for you? Because a lot has been written about it, and I haven't yep. heard so much from you. So what was it? Yeah, I mean, I think your point is kind of going back to that graphic of uh, the all the coaches that were in Washington that are now head coaches and doing extremely well. Uh, you talk about Kyle Shanahan, you're talking about Sean McVay, uh, Mike McDaniel, Matt LaFleur, and, you know, even Bobby Slowick, with, who's the coordinator for the Texans right now. It's it's one of those situations where in life, certain things just weren't meant to be. So although all those coaches have gone on to become head coaches and are doing really good in the league or great in the league right now, at that time, they just weren't ready for that. And I do think it it was because of the structure of the organization from the top down, how they did business. And what I didn't know going into Washington was that there was a rift between the owner and the head coach. I didn't know that. Listen, man, I was a 22 year old kid coming in there, having all my dreams come to a reality, being able to play quarterback in the NFL, playing with some of my favorite players ever when Santana Moss, uh, talking about Chris Cooley, Trent Williams, our left tackle, London Fletcher was our middle linebacker. It's like I was living the dream and didn't understand that the NFL at that time, I didn't understand the NFL is purely a business. And there was something going on between the owner and the head coach. And I was dead smack in the middle of it. And it wasn't necessarily anything that I did to be in that, but that's just the reality of the situation. And for me to go out there, I just wanted to win and play football So I played through injury because I wanted to do it for my guys and that set my career back. And, you know, I think the rest of it is something that can be, you know, talked about at a different time. Um, You know, I've, I've moved past it. I've moved past all those years and just used them as a learning lesson moving forward. But at some point I will break it down and, and talk about it. It just won't be today. What did you make this season after week one? So Aaron Rodgers goes down, and then you're on get up, and you're talking about – and you're trying to make a larger point about quarterbacks who are not getting another chance because they've been told behind the scenes are a distraction. And you were mentioning <laughs> yourself in that conversation, mm-hmm. and Dominique gives you kind of like this side look. And then everyone took that exchange as being, 
you were trying to position yourself to get that Jets job. How did you receive the reaction to the point you were trying to make, which was not, I think I should be the quarterback of the Jets? Yeah, I mean, you guys know Dominique. So Dominique is always facial expression, facial expression. And what people didn't, well, one, what they didn't see online from the initial clip that went viral was they cut the clip when I made the point that even I wouldn't give the Jets the best chance to win right now because it's going to take me multiple weeks to go in there, get ready, learn the system, learn the players, and then be able to go play at a high level. Now, that's just – it's social media, but I don't I don't give them a pass for that. And there were some people who wait ended up posting – Who ended up, po- who ended up posting those clips. Wait a minute. They right? get promoted. They get promoted no, no, for that. I, Yo, look, it, got the, it went viral. The context. You're right. Why it, do we need the context? What? Exactly. No, so I, I didn't let – and, Dan, I didn't let that fly. Right. I went after there's a guy in Washington. I called him a weasel because he is he is a weasel and he's been doing it for a long time <laughs> towards me. But what they what I was trying, the point I was making and I actually did make was that um, there's guys like Cam Newton. Like if we want to be realistic, Cam's been out of the league for a year. I've been out of the league for two years. Um, we can come back and play. We are, you know, we're better than the top 64 in the world at the position. But football is about so much more than just ability. It's about connectivity. And right now, me, nor Cam, nor anyone else that was on the street was going to be able to come in that building and create instant connectivity with that locker room and go out and play the position. So, yeah, do I believe I can play in the league today? Yeah, I certainly believe that. I'm a, I'm a confident guy, and, and my track record shows that I can play the for the Jets in particular, if they wanted me to come in, they, they should have called me three weeks ago so I could be ready to play this week. But guess what? Zach Wilson went and played his tail off. And, and that's what I've been trying to preach. Just give the guy a little bit of time. He's not going to be Aaron Rodgers. But the way he played against Patrick Mahomes should give you hope. And I think it gave that locker room some hope that maybe they can maybe sneak into the playoffs if they can put a couple wins together throughout the stretch. How at peace are you with never playing football again? Oh, I'm at peace. I'm at peace with it. Um, it's not a situation of desperation. And, and I think you guys, uh, you know where I'm coming from with that because as a player, you're only going to get so many years to play. Tom Brady's the greatest of all time at the quarterback position, and he only played for, I mean, what, 20 years? It's a lot, don't get me wrong, but he's got 40 years left of his life to live. And for me right now, I'm doing something in media and, and showing different sides of myself that I can do for the next 30 to 40 years. And to me that I feel great about that. So to be able to go back and play, it would have to be something that it just makes sense for me to go do that. And right now those opportunities haven't been presented to me. So I'm not in a, in a place of desperation. I saved my money, thank God, you know, and, and did everything that I was supposed to, to take care of my family. And all I'm doing right now is having fun. If somebody wants me to jump back in there and put a helmet on, I'll certainly do it. Uh, but it's got to be the right situation. How's week eight for the Jets? What do you think? <laughs> Say that again? How's week eight for the Jets? Is, what that, do you think? is that too late maybe? Maybe a little earlier? No, a little no earlier? listen. Next listen, week, I, I, I am a supporter of Zach Wilson right now because everybody's been been on, on him like white on rice. And if the Jets were to come to me next week and say, hey, we'd like to bring you in and uh, get you ready to start for us, you know, for the rest of the year, I would certainly do it. Like, it's been no yes! secret there. <laughs> Look at it's that. Been, it's, Can't put this one on. Oh, no. It's Wait been no secret. Clip it right there. there. Clip it right Wait there. No, no, this one's not the weasel's no, fault. No, this one's all you. You did this to you. RG3 in the ones has to be a podcast that is done by a player who doesn't have to read defenses. You just neutered your partnership with Wave Sports and Entertainment no, no, by no, no. selling listen, yourself w- out to the Jets. Listen, Wave Sports and Entertainment will travel with me. We'll make sure we have the podcast and we play football. The new I, starting I, quarterback for the New York Jets, week eight, week eight, uh, America. Uh, yeah. You can do podcasts from anywhere, Dan. Week eight or there you early go. from the huddle. Dan, yes, sir. But Dan, th- listen, listen. There is... There's a lot of players that are afraid to say they want to play. Yes. When they're done, they're afraid to say they want to play. I'm not afraid to say that, man. I love the game of football. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. 
And that's why I'm trying to celebrate the game and tell guys stories the right way. And I think we should all do that. I'm itching myself, scratching myself, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because are. that's you're what so, I do when I get excited. You're so yes. excited. You're also rolling a booger <laughs> oh in, your, in your hand. <laughs> I mean, that's well. excitement. <laughs> <laughs> we got a quarterback. <laughs> R R RG3, thank you for making the time for us. On your way out, though, what are you trying to do? There are a lot of people in this space. In the podcast space, Jets, yeah. everyone has has seen uh, you know, what brand management can do for you as an ex-athlete. You're going to be competitive right. with the rest of your life. You want to have a successful broadcasting career. What yep. are you trying to do with this? How will yours be different? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I'm on ESPN. Uh, I call games and, and now I have an opportunity to have a safe space to be able to connect with the football community that wants to celebrate the game. You know, it's called RG3 and the ones because I'm going to be talking to one of one type of guys. But it's also because I want the listener to become one of those ones. You know, when you talk to the greats, there's little gems that you can find from them that you can apply to your own life. And for me, it's not just about talking football. It's about talking life. It's about finding ways to create connectivity and to inspire people. So that's why my podcast is going to be different. We're going to have a ton of fun. And I know Wave Sports Entertainment is on board along with Whispering Oaks Productions, my production company, to have a blast, you know, talking ball, talking life with people that people want to talk to and want to listen from. Next time we will get parenting advice from you and get to that story of what it is that it felt like to run off that field because you couldn't have done that during a football game. You would have had to stay in that <laughs> huddle. You would not have been allowed to save that for his podcast, I would think. That is true. Uh, exactly. that's true. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. The new Jets quarterback, RG3. Now, week eight is San Diego. You want to come back the next week? Los it's Angeles. Los Angeles. Oh, I'm sorry. But it's, changed oh, wow. It's, it's the Las Vegas oh, you're talking Raiders. about yeah. you talking about Khalil Mack, who had a season worth of sacks in that one game? Yeah. No, listen. Week as nine? a competitor, yeah. we, as a competitor, whenever they call you, you show up and you play. It doesn't matter who you're going against. <laughs> Thank you, RG3. Peace out, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Robert.